Hello, everyone. Welcome to our webinar today. Our topic for today is Resilient Power for Florida Community Health Centers. This webinar is being presented by Clean Energy Group as part of our Resilient Power Project, and we have a very exciting panel lined up for you today. Before I pass it over to them, I'll go over some very quick webinar logistics. All of our attendees for the webinar are in listen-only mode. You've got a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can call in via telephone, connect via computer mic and speakers. If you'd like to minimize your webinar console, you can do that by clicking on the orange arrow that you see circled here. You can also click on that orange arrow to expand your webinar console. And one thing that you might like to do with your webinar console that we encourage you to do is to submit your questions and your comments in the questions box. We will save some time following our presentations for a Q&A. We love to hear what questions people come up with. That is one of the most exciting parts of the webinar for us. So type your questions in and we'll get to as many as we can. With that, I will now pass it over to my colleague, Marielle Mango, Mari is a project director here at Clean Energy Group, and she will get us started. Thanks, Sam. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Um, before I introduce our pre presenters, I just wanted to give a quick introduction as to who we are at Clean Energy Group, for those of you who don't know. Clean Energy Group is a primarily foundation-funded nonprofit organization. Our work involves providing technical assistance and policy support, as well as information sharing on energy, clean energy topics. Our partner organizations include state and federal agencies, industry, utilities, developers, NGOs, grassroots organizations, the list goes on. We also have a sister organization, Clean Energy States Alliance, which is a membership coalition of organizations, primarily state agencies, that manage clean energy funds, and I encourage you to check out both of our websites to learn more. This presentation today is brought to you by the Clean Energy Group's Resilient Power Project. The Resilient Power Project was created in response to Superstorm Sandy and the resulting outages in the Northeast, um, the impacts of which disproportionately impacted communities of color and low-income communities. Since then, uh, the Resilient Power Project has expanded our work, and we are currently active in advocacy, project development, um, policy expansion across the country. The Resilient Power Project aims to improve access to resilient power technologies, primarily solar PV paired with battery storage, in low-income communities and BIPOC-led communities. Resilient Power Project's partners include community organizations, nonprofits, indigenous-led organizations, affordable housing developers, and local governments. Our focus areas are policy development, one-on-one -on -one technical support, project development, and awareness building, including publishing reports like those on this slide and that we'll be talking about today. You can, again, find these resources and much more information on our website. Today's report is gonna be, uh, today's presentation is focused on the report supporting access to healthcare, a re resilient emergency power for Florida community health centers. Uh, we have everyone who is involved in the creation of this report on this call today, and we're really excited to dive in. Great. So I wanted to introduce our great list of speakers, then I'll kick it off with a, a very short um, intro and, and hand it over to them. So after my presentation today, we'll be starting with Gianna Van Winkle. She is a Florida native with almost 15 years of experience in developing community health center emergency management programs. Initially focused on safety and compliance at a Miami-based health center, she later transitioned to a statewide emergency management role at New York's Primary Care Association. In 2020, she joined the Florida Association of Community Health Centers, providing support for health centers navigating COVID the COVID-19 pandemic, highly active hurricane seasons, and other emerging threats. Currently, Gianna leads FACHC's robust emergency management programs that cover all hazard training and technical assistance programs, situational awareness, and ongoing response and recovery efforts. Up next today, we will have Andrew McCullough. He is the co-founder and CEO of Collective Energy Company, a social business specializing in bringing clean and reliable power to nonprofit community health centers in the US and abroad. Collective Energy believes that everyone, no matter where they live or how much money they have, should have equal and reliable access to health services, even when the power goes out. Andrew is also the founder and principal at Small Footprint LLC, a consulting firm that advises corporations and foundations on developing and implementing their charitable giving strategies around emergency preparation and response, community engagement and resiliency. 
Uh, Andrew is the Principal Advisor to Direct Relief's Power for Health program and previously served as the Vice President of Emergency Response and New Initiatives at Direct Relief, the largest privately funded nonprofit aid organization in California and the third largest in the country. Direct Relief provides over $2 billion in medical resources and over $100 million in grant funding to people in over 100 countries and 55 U.S. states and territories annually. Andrew spent two years living in Haiti after the 2010 earthquake and was on the ground overseeing responses to emergencies like Hurricane Sandy in New York, Typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, the Ebola crisis in West Africa, the Syrian refugee crisis, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, Maria, and Dorian, wildfires in California, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Andrew also led the team in Puerto Rico, who has implemented over 400 recovery projects on the island since Hurricane Maria. Lastly, Andrew has overseen numerous post-disaster infrastructure and energy projects, including the installation of over four megawatts of solar and battery storage for critical health facilities and community water wells that lost power after Hurricane Maria landed in Puerto Rico. And in the Bahamas, Andrew has led efforts to repair and rebuild health facilities that were damaged or destroyed in Hurricane Dorian. Finishing out will be Connor Sheehan. He's the account executive at American Microgrid Solutions. Connor um, is a former Air Force logistics officer with experience working on projects with teams from around the United States and its allies. He was handpicked to serve in unique leadership positions with oversight on projects involving supply chain management, finance, and contracting. Connor is a decorated former collegiate athlete, having won three championships playing Division I football while earning a BA in the history of science from Harvard University. Very excited to have this great group with us here, so I will jump into my presentation and then hand it over to them. Great, so I'm just gonna give a little bit of background today. The focus of our, uh, our conversation today will be on the report, um, and I thought it would be helpful to give just a little bit of background as to why we were looking at resilient power for health clinics, why health clinics are such an important community resource, but really where we're at in terms of power outages, um, health and equity. So I wanted to give a little background on Clean Energy Group's Technical Assistance Fund to start. This is a program that we offer that actually supports project development on the facility level. Uh, the Technical Assistance Fund supports the development of clean energy projects aimed at decreasing energy burdens and increasing resiliency. It funds primarily a, a techno-economic feasibility assessment from a third-party engineer that allows you to have an understanding of what would solar and battery storage look like at a particular facility. Uh, the eligibility for the program is that the facility is located in a low to moderate income community or serves otherwise marginalized communities and would like to continue to provide services in the event of a power outage. Grants range from five to 15,000, depending on the size of the project. Um, we do prioritize 50% of funding to serve uh, BIPOC-led organizations, Black, Indigenous, and people of color-led organizations, and there's a very low barrier of entry to the program. So. I bring this up because we have supported a lot of health clinics using this program. We've worked with churches, food pantries, um, nonprofits, emergency preparedness officials. It's really any institution that the community deems critical in the event of a power outage. This is a nice map um, showing some of the projects that we have supported to date using the Technical Assistance Fund. Eight years ago, I would say the majority of these projects were in the Northeast. That's why you can see quite the, the big bubble over there. But increasingly, especially over the past three or four years, we have seen a boom in applications and support across the country um, due to the climate crisis and really every state um, being impacted by natural disasters and power outages. So what is the connection between health, equity, and energy security? The reality is access to reliable electricity is integral to public health. Electricity um, is, no, is not a privilege, it's a right. Things like cooling and access to air conditioning are no longer a privilege, it's an it's a integral part of public health. Right now we're seeing um, in this country over the past 10 years, there has been a huge push towards home health care, which is amazing, allowing people to age in place or folks with access and functional needs to remain home or in a, an apartment setting. And um, while there's awesome benefits to this, there are considerations that need to be made, especially when it comes to the fact that at least two and a half million people rely on electricity dependent medical equipment in their home. Um, millions more use electricity for home care services or especially for refrigeration for medication. Uh, these folks are especially vulnerable in the event of a power outage because it could be a life-threatening situation. Even a, a short power outage, not having access to your um, medical devices is, is a major issue. 
I included here um, just a, a couple stats that I think are helpful regarding power outages compared to 2000 to 2010, weather related power outages increased by 78% between 2011 and 2021. This is especially true in the Southeast, which has had the most weather related major outages since 2000. So our conversation today about access to uh, critical community facilities having access to reliable backup power so they can remain open and operational in an outage is uh, more pertinent than ever. Home health hospitals and outages. A couple great, I think, studies of what has happened in the event of an outage when folks do not have access to reliable energy in their own home or at a critical community institution, such as their local community health clinic. Respiratory device failure in, uh, pardon me, that should say 2013 Northeast blackout um, accounted for 65 emergency department visits and 37 hospitalizations over a two day period. During the public safety power shutoffs in California in 2019, there was a 30% increase in ER patients in one hospital alone. Generator reliability concerns forced patients to travel 60 miles away. Many of them just needed a space to plug in their electricity dependent medical equipment. And in 2017, uh, just, just recently, actually, George Washington University has reported that most of the 3,000 deaths that resulted after Hurricane Maria were health complications relating from power outages. So the connection between power outages and health, public health, is, is me. It's there, it's relevant. Energy security is integral to public health. And we have to figure out how can we better support folks to be able to access health services and not have to necessarily go to a hospital um, or wait for an emergency event, which we're seeing is happening more and more um, as hospitals are some of the only institutions that are actually required to have backup power generation, whereas other critical community institutions that folks rely on regularly um, are forced to, forced to close in the event of an outage. We ended up admitting 11 people to the hospital during the first public safety power shutoff because they didn't have power to run equipment they needed. So just another highlight there as to how important it is to have a place to, to charge medical equipment and to really be able to um, provide local community-based health support. So that gets us today to our supporting access to healthcare, resilient power for Florida community health centers. That's the report we're gonna be focusing on. A little overview, the Florida Association of Community Health Centers, with whom we have uh, Gianna with us today, conducted a survey on emergency backup power capabilities at Florida's over 800 community health centers. Um, then working together with CEG uh, and Florida Association of Community Health Centers, along with input from Direct Relief and American Microgrid Solutions, we work to summarize the findings of these surveys um, and really dive into a techno-economic analysis of what so far have we seen, how could solar and storage support these facilities in the event of a um, power outage and, and what could they realistically provide. A highlight that I like to include is just how important community health clinics are in the event of a power outage. They're a trusted local community care institution. Many folks are much more familiar with their local community health clinic than they are with a hospital. For rural communities, health clinics are oftentimes the only health resource for miles. Um, despite their importance, health clinics are not required to have backup power generation, so many are forced to close in the event of a power outage or greatly limit operations. Um, we've seen that a loss of vaccines and temperature regulated medications without refrigeration is a huge issue, as are, again, residents being forced to go to hospitals, um, some of whom have difficulty even getting there, depending on uh, their socioeconomic status. I've included to the right here a uh, graph that was resulting from the report, which basically showed that 83% of health centers reported having vaccines stored at individual sites. However, only 40% of those sites reported having backup power to maintain refrigeration in the event of the outage. So the vast majority, 60% of these health centers in Florida that were polled, um, have to are forced to transport vaccines within their own network of facilities so that they can remain uh, chilled and then working refrigeration. We present here in this report, in addition to a fossil fuel options like natural gas and diesel generators, that battery storage is a reliable, resilient energy solution, uh, especially when paired with solar PV. Solar and storage can automatically island from the grid in the event of an outage. It's optimal resilience when it's paired with solar PV. So as long as the sun is shining, you have access to some backup power. Um, fuel shortages, which we have heard time and time again from community health clinics, are a major issue in the event of a natural disaster to continue their generators running. They're not an issue with solar and storage, right? 
that does not emit pollutants into communities that are already disproportionately feeling the burden of um, the impacts of climate change can deliver electricity bill savings and generate revenue, and it supports continuity of services. So it allows health net centers to actually be able to plan for um, what are they gonna do in the event of an outage? What can they support? Who can they support? I've highlighted here a value of resiliency, which is really looking at different sectors. How do we monetize the savings associated with solar and battery storage? And yeah, a lot of it is utility bills, um, utility programs that are put in place, kind of those obvious monetizable benefits, but what else is there? And it, uh, for health centers, a big part of that is what do you lose when you're forced to shut down? And daily losses from the um, survey that was conducted for this report, health centers reported potential daily losses of up to $300,000 per day of power outage, averaging about 41,000 per facility per day of power outage. Uh, this is a, a huge number, right? This is this is enormous. And this number wasn't even taken into consideration when you're estimating savings for um, solar and storage for your institution. But I think it's it's nonetheless really important to highlight because there is a value of resiliency that goes beyond kind of your, your basic utility savings. I just put here one of the health clinics that CEG has supported along with uh, Direct Relief, a health clinic case study of Crescent Care in New Orleans, Los Angeles, Los, Louisiana. Um, this is a, a great example of how a community health center has utilized solar and battery storage to improve their resilience. Um, in another great example of they were prepared. They had multiple diesel generators when Hurricane Ida landed in Louisiana. Um, they dealt with major fuel shortages so that they, they had, were forced to close anyways because they just couldn't get the fuel that they needed to keep the generators up and operational. It also took a lot of staff capacity time to try to coordinate how to get fuel. And ultimately, the generators failed. So the facility was out without power for days despite having kind of a robust backup power system. So working through the Community Lighthouse Initiative, which is led by Together New Orleans, solar and battery storage has been um, installed. There's a resiliency of five days through the solar and storage system. They have also incorporated a natural gas generator for redundancy, which I believe brings it up to nine or 10 days of backup power in the event of an outage. And um, they're anticipating 16,000 in annual electric savings. And this project, much like the ones we'll talk about today in Florida, was supported through direct relief. So great example of how health centers have already started taking advantage of resilient power technologies. There's my contact information if you're interested in learning more, but I want to pass it over now to Gianna so she can dive in more to the, the survey and the report. Awesome. Thank you so much, Marielle. And I should have control now. One moment. All right. Thank you again. It's so great to be here with all of you. Um, Marielle, you did a great job sort of laying the groundwork for what I'll speak about today. I'm a Gianna Van Winkle, as you all know, and I work for the Florida Association of Community Health Centers. A little bit about what we do. Uh, we are the state's primary care association. We work under a cooperative agreement with the Health Resource and Services Administration, HRSA, Bureau of Primary Care, to provide support for the federally qualified health centers and lookalikes throughout the state of Florida. Um, part of the cooperative agreement that we hold with them focuses on emergency preparedness, hence my role focusing on emergency management, which has in recent times evolved to encompass all types of resilient activities. And, you know, it doesn't take much imagination to reflect on what has been happening here in the state of Florida for the last several years and how important that this resilience this resilience approach is taken um, by our health centers because it requires investment, it requires time and energy, yet, you know, without it, we could see ourselves in a really bad place. So this is all part of what we sought to uncover through this work. Our health centers are located throughout the state. So as you can see on this map, there's a lot of diversity in the communities they serve, as well as the facilities themselves. We have large facilities, small facilities, and everything in between. We also have organizations that operate one site, and we have organizations that operate 20 or 30 sites. So 
you know, when we set out to support our health centers, we really need to take a tailored approach and start to work on what resilience means for these different types of organizations. All right, I'm having a little trouble advancing the slide. Let me make sure I have control. Ah, there we go. All right. So a little bit about this project. Um, you know, I, we had identified early on, I think it was after maybe the 2020 or 2021 hurricane season, you know, the, the amount of storms and the amount of threats that we were under in the state of Florida um, really put into perspective what our vulnerabilities were. And even if a storm doesn't make a direct impact, um, we often see power outages in the state. And that was actually the most common reason why health centers were closing. Um, you know, of course, we know with a more severe impact, we're going to see significant um, losses and closures due to power outages and other factors, which we'll talk about in a moment. But, you know, with armed with that information, we wanted to look at what was the current environment in our state and in how were health centers approaching the decision to adopt emergency power or install or upgrade emergency power at their sites? Um, it was right around this time that we were approached by direct relief. So there was synergy there. Um, they wanted to find out you know, what we had heard from our health centers around their interest in resilient power. Um, again, their hands-on experience, I think at the time it was specifically stemming from Hurricane Michael, but many other historical events they've responded to in Florida also kind of led them to arrive at the same place we were, really hoping to get a better understanding of how emergency power was currently being used, and then how could we expand that to increase the resiliency and promote continuity of operations. Um, by doing this, we're also seeking to increase the awareness of health centers about different options for expansion. Again, moving beyond just generators, which is what most of our health centers have. We'll talk about that in a moment, but um, also to incorporate um, solar and storage. You see here um, on this slide, sort of how the timeline was set out starting last summer. Uh, we did deploy that survey statewide. We had 32 health center organizations participate, providing not only information at the organizational level, but also site-specific information, uh, very detailed. <laughs> and so it was a great um, show of support for health centers to take the time to participate in this and kind of show there was a hunger for this information and, and a desire to learn more. Um, we did need to follow up with interviews and site visits because, you know, you can only learn so much from a survey, really getting into the nitty gritty details with our health centers about their unique factors at each of their sites. Again, the decisions that they made that led them to where they are, as well as some of um, the vulnerabilities that they've identified really kind of helped us move to the next phase. And health centers, you know, really those who wanted to move forward had a lot of momentum behind them, you know, and it was great to sort of see folks self-select into the process. Whereas, you know, we have still a group of health centers that I think are kind of very curious, but waiting to see where all of this goes, um, knowing that, you know, this is somewhat new in, in this world um, in terms of the adoption of newer types of uh, emergency power sources. So uh, currently we have 15 sites undergoing screening and those initial design steps. Um, well, actually those that 15 was split into two groups. Half is going now and we'll be revisiting the other half um, hopefully later this year. But um, as we move forward, we continue to learn more again about each health center's unique needs and what the systems may look like is going to inform our future efforts. So again, not to go back too far, Marielle did a great job of sort of describing what is in the report. Um, you know, we're we're gonna focus here for the rest of my time on 
how we have incorporated the survey results to develop some recommendations for health centers and where we at FAC plan to go with this information and how we plan to move forward uh, both with our health centers as well as our partners uh, in state and nationally. So again, Returning to our survey findings, Marielle mentioned that, you know, based on the information we collected, approximately 40% of health center service sites, so excluding the school-based sites and excluding the mobile units, so we're talking about our brick and mortar, more, more typical clinic sites that you would think of, approximately 40% of those sites have an emergency um, backup power source. And those that do have one, about 45% of those utilize a diesel generator. Uh, Marielle touched on the issues around fuel. We have definitely observed that firsthand during emergencies um, because the just the, the setup of our state here in Florida, we know that there can be transportation bottlenecks and we know that the fuel that's coming in is prioritized for critical facilities like hospitals. So um, that is another selling point, another benefit of incorporating a hybrid model, which is you know, what we're looking at through this project. Um, it was very interesting to see that um, only about 19% of the health centers had identified potential partners or funding for systems, but there was about 80%, it was almost complete, exactly converse, 80% um, wanted to explore these options. So we really came to the conclusion that we were headed in the right direction. And with the partnership and support of Direct Relief, we're able to really not only just collect this information, but take action on it, which is really exciting. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did, this goes back to that awareness raising effort, is to assess what are the current barriers, whether those are real or perceived, um, that health centers are facing when it comes to the expansion of emergency power. So the most uh, prominent one was economics. Um, people cited the installation cost as well as the maintenance cost as the primary barrier. Second to that was the structure and location. Health centers, as I mentioned before, um, are in a wide variety of different types of communities and different types of buildings. So certain health centers found either the age or structure or um, flooding vulnerability of their sites to be an issue or a potential barrier. And then the one that we thought we could most quickly affect change on was uh, knowledge and capacity. So over 20% of those health centers that responded really quite honestly said, we don't have the time, the people, or um, you know, the, the ability to know where to start on this work. So we wanted to swoop in and provide some resources and information that would give them that guidance to, to take those first steps and kind of assess where they could go next with this information. So moving on to CHC recommendations. I might have to click again, all right. Oh, there we go. Um, we set out to provide these recommendations to all health centers. So this report has been shared widely. It is available both on the CEG website as well as the FAC website. Um, we recently hosted a webinar specifically for health centers, and we really wanted to provide them with a solid set of recommendations to move forward, no matter where they were, no matter what barriers they were potentially facing. Um, the first one was to find the time Time and you know, reach out if needed for assistance on this, but start to assess what is your health center's need for emergency power. And that in, in many cases starts with understanding what is your facility's current energy consumption? Uh, what are the critical functions that you would need to power at each of your sites in order to make them better positioned to remain operational? Again, I think this also, calls for taking another look at what is really the cost of a closure 
at each site. Um, it's going to vary based on the staff at the site, the, the resources that are stored there, and the number of patients that are served. So one of the things that we plan to do is to spend some time developing a formula to help health centers better calculate what are the costs associated with a closure or a power outage. Um, and then you know, just to expand the way forward, you know, there is a broad range of emergency power options. You know, we have our traditional generators that most people are pretty well aware of or have currently, right? Um, then there's the addition of solar and storage and that hybrid model. I think a lot of our health centers found that to be the most attractive because it, it provides another layer of resilience. Um, and, uh, the ability to use a generator more efficiently. So um, that is how we, we plan to move forward. And similar to the slide that um, Marielle shared about Crescent Care, we hope to have many case studies going forward um, as to how this looks in a Florida-based community health center of varying sizes. Um, we want our health centers to continue to communicate with us and also with their local emergency management groups and planners and health departments to communicate how important emergency power is to them remaining open. Uh, as Marielle demonstrated through some of the data that she pulled, health centers are a lifeline for many people living in medically underserved communities. They provide culturally competent care. They provide care regardless of ability to pay. So when these health centers are no longer operating, that is a significant impact on a, health, on a community that is already suffering due to um, potentially a broader emergency or a simple widespread power outage. So, you know, by, by, um, describing how these these outages impact health centers, um, our local emergency managers can help better plan and consider these as priority sites, whether that be for restoration efforts or for mitigation projects. Um, we do plan to update our report in 2024 uh, based on the information that is learned. Um, I won't go too deep into that because I know both uh, Andrew and Connor are coming up next to kind of talk a little bit about our ongoing work with these health centers. But um, again, just so excited to be part of this project and to be supporting our health centers um, each step of the way. That's it for me. Thanks so much. I guess I'll be passing it over to Andrew then. Hi, Andrew. Thanks, Jenna. <clears throat> um, thanks everybody for being here and listening. Um, thanks to Clean Energy Group for putting this webinar on. My name is Andrew McCullough. Um, I am the representing um, Direct Relief, uh, an amazing nonprofit organization that uh, recognized um, early on this need for reliable power uh, for the community health centers that they support. And just speaking today to kind of set this, remember what's happening in our in our country at least today. We're in record-setting heat wave. I think Fourth of July, the highest heat set record set um, ever. We have 50 million people right now across the country facing extreme heat, and uh, we'll be setting records in Death Valley this weekend of 130 degrees. So, um, sort of a seems like it's every summer, but it's timely to be talking about why resilient power is necessary, especially for the most vulnerable in our communities. Who, if you're living outside, if you're homeless, or you're working outdoors and you're in back to back 110, 120 plus degree heat, um, you're, you're going to need a place to go uh, and community health centers can offer that support. So um, we, as Gianna mentioned, you know, reliable power is a, is a right and um, we're trying to address this for the most vulnerable in our communities by clean energy microgrids for community health centers. Um, so again, I'm trying to address, there we go. Um, 
both, uh, so Direct Relief, a fantastic nonprofit organization that sends medicine and medical supplies all around the world and supports community health centers here in our country with donations of, of medicine. And often it's cold chain prescription drugs um, like insulin and vaccines. And Direct Relief realized that um, if health centers couldn't stay powered, these critical life-saving expensive medications, which are more and more now requiring refrigeration, um, go bad. They can't see, they can't help their patients in the way um, they're supposed to. And Direct Relief, to their credit, became involved in installing microgrids in, in Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, longest blackout in US history. Every health center on the island had a generator, but none of them had power. So all that they wanted was to, to ensure that their experience after Hurricane Maria and not being able to serve their patients never happened again. And so um, went about installing clean energy microgrids for about 20 health centers on the island and plus many, um, many uh, communities that relied on a well for water and without a pump, you couldn't pump the water. And that's why people didn't have water after Hurricane Maria. And so, um, and then I became so passionate about this work um, and believing in this work um, that I also um, ended up starting a company to specifically focus on this issue as well called Collective Energy. Um, so some of the, I'm just going to lay out the sort of problem statement, but again, I'm going to, we, this group has spent a lot of time together, so we sometimes say similar things, so I'll, I'll breeze through, but essentially you cannot provide rel uh, quality healthcare without power. Um, hospitals have always been required backup power because that is known. You need power to provide quality healthcare. Um, community health centers in our country have never been required to have backup power, but are now required to have electronic health records and to, and to store medications in refrigerators. And so this is now a problem that they, that they have to solve. And what we know is the communities they serve are hit first and worst. And so they they even you know have a, a more need for reliable power uh, as the grid is becoming worse and worse and less efficient and old. Uh, right now, if you look at that map, there's 14,000 customers without power in my state in California, and there's no special care for health centers um, to, to not lose their power. Second problem is climate change, which is that um, you know, climate change is negatively impacting healthcare, and the health sector is a large contributor to climate change. So um, they'd be the fifth largest contributor to CO2 emissions if they were a country. And so um, this idea that these health facilities are seeing patients that are, you know, um, negatively impacted by the thing that they're um, contributing to. Uh, and so what better way to improve health than also to um, be doing it with clean energy um, and green energy instead of making the problem worse. And then three, these rising costs of, of electricity. And so um, power costs are going up year over year with no end in sight. It's a large budget item for many health centers and one that they can't lock in place. And so a clean energy microgrid can help them um, keep their costs in check and be able to plan 25 years out that they can have stable power costs. Um, so uh, again, my, my experience was being on the ground in every major disaster in our country since um, Hurricane Sandy and before. Um, a lot of people now uh, who like didn't and i saw time and time again going to health centers and bringing medicines to them that they had to close their doors because they didn't have any power and to me it was the kind of it was the most tragic thing to see a health center that serves the most vulnerable uh, and has systems in place has staff in place has the right medicines in place has um is able to care for people but simply cannot due to power. And so it became this recurring thing that would happen every time I would uh, be on 
be on site with the health center and so really coalesced after Hurricane Maria where we can do something about this. Uh, there is a way to prevent these power outages and it's gonna help them save money and be more green along the way. And so um, the goal is to help every health center in the country who wants one to get a clean energy microgrid. This was a, a from a, a trip in Florida after Hurricane Michael and after many years of being in the disaster response world, I realized that it's actually the most important people to see after a disaster are these power companies um, and, the power, and the electrical trucks coming around to restore power. Because if you've ever been without power, if you've ever been in a disaster and the power is out, it's, it controls everything. Um, it, all everyone is talking about is when is the power going to come on how long is it going to be and you never know and so what i learned is is this is the most important thing is to see these trucks um, restoring power um, there's a lot of causes of power shutoffs so we don't need to go through all of them i've been talking about disa uh, disasters and climate caused power outages but um high right now it's this it's high demand it's the heat and the heat and the uh, need for more cooling is just causing brownouts and blackouts. And it always happens in communities that can least afford it. Um, uh, as well as, you know, while obviously these now in California, what they call public safety power shutoffs, which is just the utilities just decide to shut off the power when the wind blows and they are trying to prevent wildfires. Uh, but it's that's clearly not a great solution, and there's no plan to fix this. So, in, um, again, in, in Puerto Rico is where it, it sort of coalesced for direct relief, and and for me personally, when we were driving around the island um, after Hurricane Maria, delivering insulin to health centers um, who couldn't keep it cold, so we we were making daily deliveries, and as Gianna mentioned the studies show it wasn't the immediate impact of of the of the hurricane or the disaster that that killed people in puerto rico it was the extended long-term power outages it was the same thing we saw in the cold snap in texas uh, a year ago february it was power loss that killed people uh, it's some people now tell me they understand what I do after seeing or reading the book Five Days at Memorial. It's now a show on Apple TV about the, the days after Hurricane Katrina at Memorial Hospital when they lost power because the generator flooded. That was days later. It wasn't the hurricane that caused the problem. It was the subsequent flooding and power loss that then led to 82 people dying. So we saw this in Puerto Rico. The health centers that were going through it clearly knew the, the priority and that's when direct relief to their credit great credit pivoted and, and said okay we are going to address this challenge because this is what you're all saying is what you want what you need um so a lot of reasons why this matters. We've talked about it uh Gianna's talked about it and and Marielle have talked about it so I won't need a um, belabor this, but um, continuity of healthcare, um, ensuring your patients can can go to a facility, get their medicine, get their care. Also, though, there's these these ongoing um, aftermath effects. A health center closes and people flood into the ERs because that's the only other option. Um, that's not a great solution. Uh, we have um, we have these. Um, and a health center closing down for power loss, they, they lose money and it's not a reimbursable expense. So it's a true financial hit to a health center who has to go through um, a power outage. And so this is what we saw back to Puerto Rico. Um, I just show this slide because the, where the heart is is where Puerto Rico would be. There's, when there's no power, you can't even see it. Um, even over here, it was Haiti. 85% uh, of the country has no power, Let's, uh, but they you can at least see them from space. After Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico was completely black and it was like that for weeks. And so power, again, is everything. It's communication, it's water, it's healthcare. Um, and 
it was what unfortunately led to the over 3,000 deaths. Um, so we um, directly funded a number of, of microgrids for community health centers, and the proof has been in the pudding. Um, they, the island has lost power island-wide twice, at least twice since Hurricane Maria, one due to earthquakes and one due to fire in the generating plant. And all the facilities that had microgrids con continued operations, um, could see their patients, and they've been saving tens of thousands of dollars in these years since they've had uh, microgrids. So the, the goals of this, again, are starting with patient care, lost, um, you know, avoided loss of life, and then moves to, not moves to, I mean, why this program is so amazing is because it has so many goals and you can rank them where you want to rank them, but between patient care, uh, financial benefits, as well as climate benefits, all wrapped into this one, one project. Um, so I'm going to, I think one thing that, well, real quickly, if those of you don't know about uh, the, the background of health centers, Gianna talked about them a little, but started in the, in the 60s as part of the Civil Rights Act and the Great Society Program to provide healthcare and specifically in medically underserved communities and to provide care to the most vulnerable without turning anyone away. And there are now over 14,000 of them. Um, they're the largest aggregated together. They'd be the largest healthcare provider in our country. About one in 10 Americans gets their care from a health center. One in five people in rural America goes to a health center. 95% uh, are under the of their patients are under the poverty line, 65% are racial and ethnic minorities. And so for anyone knows about sort of what's going on with the Inflation Reduction Act and the federal funding that's coming out to support clean energy projects in specifically low-income communities, Justice 40 communities, um, energy communities, health centers are by part and parcel of who they are and who they serve, they are in all those communities. So I think I've looked at the data and see that over 80% of health centers exist in Justice 40 communities, which are uh, putting together the social vulnerabilities of, of a location and, and making sure that clean energy projects are prioritized for the communities that for so long have suffered from the negative impacts of our climate and zoning and water quality issues. So the, the health centers are, um, again, a network that are in every community and can lead the way in clean energy, uh, especially with the funding that's coming out of the federal government to support these types of projects. Um, and again, it hits a lot of buckets, equity, environmental justice, clean energy, climate, disadvantaged communities, environmental justice, and healthcare. Um, I'm not going to talk about how it works because Connor's going to talk about that um, and the battery and its value, which I know uh, Mari and Gianna have already talked about. One thing that um, we they wanted to have me talk about is, is how health centers can pay for this. And so, um, Again, when direct relief and some of these Florida projects and some California projects directly and Puerto Rico, direct relief has had the amazing ability to fund these projects with charitable dollars. Um, that and so it's a 100% grant to the health center. Uh, it's also true that to solve this problem across the country, uh, it about. If, if every health center in the country were to get a clean energy microgrid, it's about a three to five billion dollar capital need to fund all of them. And so clearly all, all ways of paying are going to be needed from federal funding to grants to health centers can pay themselves and get the rebate from the Inflation Reduction Act to tax equity investors and third party financers. So what we do is help health centers understand their options for how they can pay for these systems uh, if and when grants aren't readily available or how to help drive them into grants when they are. And so 
Uh, health centers have an amazing ability now with the Inflation Reduction Act to, to get 30 to 50% off the cost of a clean energy microgrid um, because of the new laws allowing nonprofits to get um, rebates back from the federal government. There's also a um, another option, which is uh, what's called an energy service agreement or a power purchase agreement. And that's been the, the most common way in the last 30 years for a nonprofit to, to install a clean energy system um, when they weren't eligible for tax credits, whereby you have a, a, a company, um, uh, and, and this is what Collective Energy does for health centers that don't have the funding to do it on their own. And, and we invest in the project on their behalf, uh, install a system on their building, and they simply pay it off every month through the energy that that system is producing. So it's sort of a shared value structure where they're, they're benefiting from cleaner and more resilient and lower cost energy. And we're helping, helping that by installing a system on their rooftop. So there's lots of ways now that health centers are able to kind of take advantage of different opportunities. We think that you know, access to capital should not be a reason uh, one of these systems isn't installed. And so we try to just make them aware of all their options. Um, this one has been talked about, so I'm gonna skip to, uh, this is Direct Relief's own warehouse. Um, it was the first permitted microgrid in, in the United States, commercially permitted microgrid in 2017. It's a large warehouse with uh, $2 billion worth of medicine flowing through it every year in, a, in an extremely, um, climate prone and power loss prone area um, in Santa Barbara, California. And, and so this microgrid was installed on this facility for the same reason a health center would install a microgrid on their facility. It's that they, they can't afford to lose power and they can't afford to lose all the medicines inside that building. So it's a, it's a solar battery microgrid with a backup generator and so you turned on essentially multiple times from power loss in Santa Barbara. And I think this was really what, how Direct Relief saw, like if we need this, clearly the health centers that we support with this medicine that is coming out of this warehouse will need this as well. Um, uh, Nat, so uh, a couple other groups are involved with this. The National Association of Community Health Centers is very involved in this now. They're pushing it. Uh, education out to health centers, case studies out to health centers to show who of their colleagues are doing it and why to to support why health centers should should try to do this. Capital Link is a financing um, capital planner to health centers, and they can help health centers understand the the costs associated with it, the benefits, as well as with loans to do it. Um, and I will. Lots of other partners uh, as well, including some on the call that make this all possible. And so far, I think now from from Puerto Rico, where from 2018, where I think there were about 16 health centers that were um, supported, um, Direct Relief and other partners and Collective Energy are now, there's probably now over 150 health centers across the country that are going through the process of installing clean energy microgrids. So it's come a long way in a number of years and um, a lot more to go, but um, encourage everyone on the call to, if they wanna get involved, there's lots of ways to get involved. So I will stop there and I will send it over to Connor for, for the technical side. Thanks, Andrew, appreciate it. I think I have control to click through. All right, so my name is Connor Sheehan and I'm an account executive with American Microgrid Solutions and we're really excited to be a part of these programs and initiatives with the FACT, CEG, and Direct Relief and to be a part of this discussion today. So I'm gonna walk you through the different factors that go into our analyses and what we look for and, and then discuss the results of the resilient power screenings for these Florida health centers. Through, there we go. 
So first, I'll give you a little bit of background on AMS and what we do. So we design and develop energy solutions for our clients to meet their financial, resilience, and sustainability goals. These systems that we create combine solar and other forms of renewable generation, uh, batteries, fossil fuel generators, and controls to integrate all those different components. So in the 100 plus projects that we have in analysis, development are already completed. Uh, we work with the host of the facility to design a solution around the facility's unique constraints to meet their goals and then oversee that solution's implementation into reality because we're not just interested in doing thought experiments or academic exercises. We truly want to see all of these projects get built and the value of a microgrid be brought to all those communities. And so what we're doing with the Power for Health program is providing the initial analysis to help aid in determining which sites are best suited for a resilient power system and the grant from direct relief, and then managing those projects through RFP and final completion. And all the hosts of these facilities have other jobs and responsibilities associated with running health centers. So uh, we don't, uh, they don't need the additional uh, workload associated with learning all there is to know about a resilient power system and uh, managing that process through completion. So that's where we come in. So uh, because there might be some people on the call who aren't familiar with what a resilient power system is, here's a quick overview. This is a system that integrates various forms of energy generation and backup power to provide a building or campus with the ability to maintain critical operations during grid outages. So it's designed to ensure that a reliable and continuous supply of electricity goes to its users. Uh, most of the time, the grid is gonna be operating uh, as it should, just normally, and facilities will have a constant stream of electrons flow into the buildings and powering its loads from the grid. And after a solar and storage system is installed, uh, the biggest difference for the owner during this time is just that they'll see lower utility bills. Uh, however, as I'm sure everyone has experienced at one point or another, the grid will fail and leave you without power for an unknown amount of time. So you could be without power for minutes, hours, days, or weeks, all depending on the nature of the outage. And when the grid goes down, uh, on-site renewable generation and fossil fuel generators will feed into your battery and supply your facility with power to continue your operations, which could be the entire facility or a predefined portion of the facility identified by the host as being critical. So we always look to balance the host goals when determining, uh, when designing and developing a project. The first being resilience. What does the facility need to be backed up? What is the minimum length of time those loads need to be backed up? What about the typical length of time? And resilience is what provides you with the ability to maintain your operations through outages. Next is sustainability. And uh, uh, this is directly tied to the amount of solar you can put on your facility. So in a little bit, we'll talk about some constraints to maximizing your solar, but here just know, the more solar panels you can get on your property through roof, carport, or ground mount installations, the more solar production you will have and the more carbon you will offset. And finally, economics. Uh, everybody has slightly different economic goals and constraints, whether that's an initial budget, like Gianna was talking about being the number one barrier for health centers and, and getting a resilient power system, or a certain required payback period or desired 20 year cash flow or even a goal of just stabilizing your energy needs and getting more predictable uh, future utility expenses. So it's essential to consider all of these areas when we design a system and weigh the importance of each category so that we can fine tune the system to meet the host specific and unique needs. So our objective for these screenings was to identify a solar and storage and generator solution that would provide each site with at least four hours of backup. So minimum worst case scenario, uh, and typically eight hours of backup. So that's gonna be average throughout the year. Uh, and the budget we were working with was $500,000 per site. Although some sites had something unique with them that would push that anticipated system cost up over the $500,000 threshold. Uh, and whenever we get a portfolio of sites like this, we understand that all sites are unique and require careful review of their specific characteristics, and these 15 were no exception. So we have to consider the existing facility conditions. What is the roof like? Is there room for a battery? 
If there's a generator already present, how will that interact with the rest of the solar and storage system? What is uh, the typical load profile for the building? Can we segregate smaller a smaller portion of the building that is most important to the host, like servers, vaccine refrigeration, or HVAC? Uh, how much carbon offset can we get? What level of cost reduction can be achieved on the battery through the integration of solar? And all of these factors are weighed in these reports, uh, uh, this report's results. So starting off, we begin evaluating a building's characteristics, specifically with the roof's orientation, available space for solar panels, potential shading on those panels, how old the roof is, et cetera. Uh, ideally, there would be very little congestion on the roof. Uh, any congestion will limit the maximum solar installation, and it can be something as small as a an exhaust pipe or a fan like in the top picture or as large as a big HVAC unit like in the bottom picture. And batteries and generators can vary in size and therefore they require different amounts of space to house them. It's most ideal to have a physical space around the outside of the building to house those items because it's more cost effective and it's faster to get through permitting. Now, batteries can go inside but they bring other requirements like needing to adhere to different fire codes when they're placed inside. And most of the time we find that there isn't even a spot available inside for a battery because all rooms are already occupied uh, and serve other functions. And so we also look at the electrical setup. Uh, uh, reading the electrical single line diagram and panel schedules will show us if there's any upgrades needed to the current layout in order to support a new solar and storage system. And uh, also if we can easily segregate the critical loads that the host identified. Uh, even if there is a generator present already, that does not mean there's no need for a solar and storage system. So uh, pardon the double negative there, but uh, generators do offer a good form of redundant backup power, but they have their fair share of problems. So integrating generators and batteries is very advantageous to the site. And we'll often set up a generator to feed into the battery. So that uh, once the battery depletes to a certain level, say, you know, 25%, then we'll program the generator to run at full speed, when, uh, which is its most efficient mode, bringing the battery back up to full charge. And in doing this, we don't make the generator try to handle the peaks and dips of a facility's energy needs because it's really not good at that. It's not that efficient. Instead, the battery handles those peaks and dips uh, because that's one of the uh, many things that it's really good at. Uh, and then finally, we need to consider the utilities rules and requirements for interconnecting, if there's anything special, like how much solar we can act we're actually allowed to put on the roof, uh, along with requirements for from local permitting officials. Uh, analyzing the building's energy consumption patterns is essential to determine the appropriate size of the solar and, syst solar and storage system. Uh, we review historical energy usage, so utility bills or interval data, if that's available, and that helps us to understand peak demand periods, overall energy usage, and seasonal variations. So here, this is one of the Florida site's load profiles and is a common annual load profile where their usage goes up in the summer, which is probably because of an increased HVAC usage. And uh, I know there are budget constraints with almost every project as we've talked about plenty of times during this call already. Uh, so the cost of a system is gonna be directly tied to how, uh, how much the battery backs up. So the more loads the battery supports, the larger the battery needs to be and the larger the price tag on that battery. And that's one of the major reasons why we work with the host to pick out the critical loads so that we can ensure the system supports the things that matter most to the host without breaking the bank. So we also considered the desired level of energy autonomy when determining battery power and capacity. So again, how long does the facility need to be backed up and what loads? We model outages, power outages starting at every hour of the year. So 8,760 of those. Uh, January at 2 a.m. is a lot different than uh, July at 2 p.m. Uh, and so we uh, evaluate the system's energy performance during power outages to ensure the selected battery will meet the host's uh, resilience goals all throughout the year. So if we need to get four hours uh, minimum, then we need to have four hours minimum in January in the morning, also in July in the afternoon. 
And so here we see a system that was designed to have a minimum of four hours of backup all throughout the year. And that's why the, the light green doesn't get close to zero and uh, typical of 12 hours of resilience all throughout the year. And that's that dark green line there. Uh, and so just because the system is designed to get at least four hours and typically eight or 12 hours of backup does not mean that you won't get more resilience than that at any given point. In fact, you are expected to have much more backup power than just that throughout the year, uh, given the right conditions. So uh, here we see the uh, site is projecting to get 72 hours or more of resilience in December because it's meeting those right conditions. It's getting enough solar production and it's also have, has a, a low load on the building. But we also assess the economic viability of the solar and storage system uh, and uh, use metrics like internal rate of return, that present value, simple payback period, uh, all to help uh, the host gauge the economic impacts of the system at each facility. And so we evaluate initial uh, investment costs, so components and labor, uh, any development fees or anything like that, uh, replacement part costs like we see there in uh, year 12, and you see a dip down, that's for some replacement parts. And then also it's kind of hard to see, but there is a dip down in year 16 for more replacement parts. Uh, ongoing costs like O&M, uh, all against the potential uti utility savings. Uh, we also consider available incentives like renewable energy credits if they're available, uh, tax credits like the ITC rebate, which sits at a base rate of 30% with adders to bring the potential rebate all the way up to 70% of the total system cost. Uh, we also consider grants or uh, as Andrew was saying, energy service agreements and power purchase agreements to make the project more financially feasible. And uh, the last thing I'll say on this is that it's important to note that not all systems will generate a positive cash flow, but there are other things that no one can include in the financial forecast that you should consider when determining whether a, a system is worth the investment, like the avoided costs of outages. So when we were talking before about the uh, needing to have backup power for all the vaccines, how valuable is it to secure vaccines and medications from spoiling and to not have to transport them to a different facility that does have backup power? Or how important is it that your servers don't go down and continue operating to support your network of facilities? So as mentioned earlier, sustainability impact of a system is going to be directly tied to solar production, meaning the more solar production you can get, the greater your carbon offset will be. And even if you can't get to a net zero system, like this one is not a net zero system, even if you can't get to that uh, and offset all of your electricity needs, every bit of carbon offset is important. And so here, this isn't a net zero system. This is a system that offsets about 40% of the facility's uh, annual electricity needs. And for Florida, this is what we would expect for a typical solar production profile uh, with the uh, peak being in May, which is just before the rainy season kicks in and it gets really cloudy in, in the summer and then uh, dips again in the winter. Okay, and here we see the results for seven of the 15 sites as shown in the white paper published, uh, I think a month or two ago. And these seven sites were selected based on square footage of the facility, so we could display a wide range of facilities and system sizes. And uh, like I said, this is the chart in the white papers, which is on CEG's website. And actually, I believe it was shared in the chat. So I'm not gonna use up everyone's time with uh, going over each line, but I will talk about the results as a whole. So each one of these sites is unique. So while you can deduce some trends from looking at this, you can't create any one formula to right size a system to meet your specific set of goals. So I wanna caution anyone from concluding, oh, you know, my building also has a square footage of 6,480 square feet, and so a resilient power system is gonna cost me X and get me Y hours and backup. Perfect, I got my answer. It doesn't quite work that way. Uh, some of these sites might be smaller square footage, but older, so they use more energy or have different functions like dental that draw more power than larger square footage buildings without that function. Uh, some sites might have easily segregable critical loads and uh, while others might have additional costs associated with segregating those loads because the building's infrastructure, electrical infrastructure needs upgrading. So generally speaking, the more resilience you want or need, 
the bigger the system will have to be, or the more important it will be to identify critical loads to keep the project costs down. Also, in general, the less congested your roof is, the, uh, or the more area you have for ground mount solar, uh, the more you can, uh, the more solar you can put on your property, and the more savings you will get by offsetting, uh, offsetting your electrical uh, utility needs through producing your own electricity. And uh, these numbers are all really great starting points. I don't want to take away from that. These are really good starting points. But remember that each site is unique. And to get a true evaluation of how a resilient power system could meet your goals, we'd need to get more information that's not included in this chart, uh, starting with your utility bills. Uh, the last thing I'll say in this slide is that the price tag of a system does not correlate with how valuable it is to the host. Systems vary in cost across the country. So the exact same system might cost very different in Florida, Massachusetts, or California, or any state. Uh, also, what's supported, so those critical loads, or just the general building in, in general, uh, what's supported could mean a lot more to someone in one part of the country or one industry than another. So backup power for refrigeration is very important to health centers, because without it, they risk losing all of their temperature sensitive vaccines and medications uh, during an outage, meaning they can't serve their community. However, for a multifamily housing complex, loss of refrigeration doesn't have those same negative impacts. It's not great, certainly not great with food spoiling and whatnot, but certainly not to the same level as a health center. But maintaining HVAC could be very critical to their residents, especially if they have frequent power outages on hot summer days. All right, so wrapping it up, selecting the right building for a solar and storage system involves careful consideration of several factors. We should evaluate the site specific characteristics and understand your economic resilience and sustainability goals to right size a system that will meet your needs. And all of this is just so you can make a informed decision that maximizes the benefits of solar and storage at your facility. And with that, thank you for your attention. Here's my contact information and I will pass it back to Marielle. All right, great. Thank you so much, everyone. I'm gonna ask our panelists if you could just, uh, if you were able to, to pop back up on camera. Thank you for everyone who submitted questions. I, I doubt with 15 minutes left that we are gonna get to all of them. So I've tried to, to pick as many as I can, but I do encourage you to reach out to um, my, me directly uh, if you have any questions that weren't answered and I'm happy to connect you to our panelists or give you some insight. So. Let's jump in. Big question that we're getting a lot is, it seems like these uh, systems, as of right now at least, come nowhere near paying for themselves based on the, uh, the annual energy savings in a under 20 year time frame. So I guess we can, uh, Connor and Andrew, start with you, is how, um, how do you anticipate that the, pre how does financing work for systems that don't necessarily have the best economics in terms of payback and things like that is it flexible is there flexibility or do you anticipate most of these critical community facilities that have projects like this would really need to grant fundraise to make it happen uh, i'll start i'll start um and i think i would say unfortunately it is dependent on where the facility is located uh the if you're looking at pure specific return on investment it's based on how much they pay in power. So a hundred percent, these systems can have a good return on investment and pay off in certain parts of our country where power costs are high. That's California, Hawaii, Puerto Rico, New England, the Northeast. Um, additionally, because of the Inflation Reduction Act, every, nearly every single one of these projects gets a 40% discount on the cost of the system because they're nonprofits located even in either low income or energy communities. So off off across the board there's a 40% discount. They'll get that whether they pay themselves or if it's financed, it'll still be claimed by a tax credit. So the cost is coming down 60% across the board no matter what. On top of that, local energy company rebates and incentives. We're looking at projects in Massachusetts and Connecticut right now that are net positive hundreds of thousands of dollars over 20 years because of the combination of those benefits. So uh, agreed uh, in parts of our country where energy is subsidized and people are paying less than 10 cents 
and a kilowatt hour in power, harder, harder to pencil grant funding still very uh, much uh, would help the, the, the economics of those projects. Other parts of the country, they work now. I want to know too, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the chart that you showed, Connor, in the report, um, the the final numbers for finance for the system installation did not include any ITC estimates, correct? It was just the blanket cost. Are you referring to the cash flow forecast? That yeah. Showed? yeah. That one did. So that one was not one of the uh, projects as part of the uh, Power for Health program where it's uh, all grant funded. Those ones we have uh, basically a uh, year zero cash flow of uh, zero because uh, it's all the capex is paid for up front and then you just have all the future costs of income from utility savings and expenses from the uh, from the um, o and m but so if we go back a few slides here i don't know who has controls if that's me or not Sorry, Connor, like, what number slide is it? I think it's like slide nine, I think. There we go. Okay, yep. So you. here, what we see in year one is that big jump up where it says $200,000, the line's all the way up to $200,000. That's that Inflation Reduction Act where the, the rebate came back to them. So that is a huge cash flow coming back to them in year one as uh, the rebate for the system. And, so all of these systems have extra value on them that can't necessarily be captured in this. So this is just financial. So like Andrew was saying, basically, if you have high utility expenses, then the system will pencil financially a lot you know, more easily. However, there are other things. So um, making sure that your vaccines don't spoil. So you have a certain amount of vaccines on on hand and there's a value to those uh, a dollar figure placed on those we can't necessarily quantify that and say that for sure all the power outages are are going to be uh, mitigated and that if they weren't mitigated then you would have lost all of those uh, vaccines it's it's a very very delicate thing so what we can do is say this is what the system will do for you without that and say this is what your 20-year cash flow will be what your net present value will be now you as the health center you have a very good understanding on what you have on site and uh, how valuable it is to keep those vaccines refrigerated and, and being able to continue to serve the facility or how difficult it is to actually transport those to another facility maybe another facility is uh, 40 miles away that's the closest one that you can get then it's really really critical that you have backup power because transporting those during uh, a crisis could be very problematic and so it is up to the the host to take this information and use it to help gauge whether or not this 20-year cash flow justifies being able or, or the uh, value of keeping those loads powered is uh, justified by the 20-year cash flow obviously when you have a system that pencils and it's saying hey you're gonna uh, over 20 years you're gonna be saving close to four hundred thousand dollars and that's a pretty easy decision but other ones where it's closer to zero or a, a negative 20-year cash flow then that's when you have to start making those decisions it's really helpful thanks um Gianna, the next question is for you. Did you find that when you were working with health centers that you had anyone, was it more pushback against solar and storage and like, we really just want to rely on fossil fuel because that's what we know? Or did, was it more of an education in terms of we just don't know what solar and storage technologies are? I think there's a mix. I think uh, the majority of folks were just unaware of how these types of systems could be integrated with what they currently have. Again, some of this might be the Floridaness of it all. Um, you know, in comparison to some other states, uh, we haven't seen, we'll say, as much movement, ironically, here in the sunshine, say, towards solar as we probably could. Um, that being said, there there is projects out there. Um, I, I feel like 
in this state, you know, there's, again, some polarization about people who have heard things about solar, but not a lot of firsthand experience working with it. So I think we were able to overcome a lot of that, actually um, polling folks on the webinar we had recently for health centers, 100% of the participants said that through this initiative, they had learned something about backup power in general. And I think 80% of them said specifically about solar and storage. So um, we're making some headway there. Um, nevertheless, I think that, you know, those who are still a little adverse to adopting what is considered a newer technology uh, may come around. Again, once we have these case studies of health centers in Florida and the benefits that it could provide them and the cost savings that it could provide. Um, again, this is going to vary site by site, so we'll have to present health centers with that information um, when they, you know, seek it out. Um, that being said, I also think that some health centers have pretty good experience with the generators that they have, so why would they make that change now? Um, then again, I will tell you after Hurricane Ian, I heard of a number of health centers who had their generator um, damaged by debris or flooded or um, some type of overheating, mechanical failure or a gas leak. I heard all of those just after Hurricane Ian. So um, no doubt, I think we're all realistic knowing that they can fail, but until you experience something like that firsthand, you might not have that motivation to seek out something new. Yeah, that's really helpful. We got a lot of questions regarding that. Uh, another one, and I, I can throw this to the group really, I think you'd all be qualified here to, to chat about this, is how much has um, safety concerns related to battery storage played into an interest, first off, in solar and storage? And secondly, the actual ability to implement it. Are you seeing that like fire departments or other places in your experience are actually a hindrance to solar and storage design? Or is most of the has any concern been brought up by actual facility owners because they aren't aware of the technologies? Yeah, I'll, I'll start off with that one. So it is um, newer technology than uh, fossil fuel generation. So like diesel generators, natural gas generators. So there might be a little bit of extra permitting process that we have to go through and time to get local authorities to approve the plans. And then as we're going through and the system's been installed to you know, give that last check and, and commission it. And so I would say that there are some delays in projects due to that, but overall batteries are very, very safe and uh, and are a very, very good alternative to a very, a very safe alternative to fossil fuel generators. Yeah, and just to add, I mean, again, I think partly it depends on the community and the location you're in and how used to they are with dealing with this technology. As you said, Gianna, it is new. And so I think we've, yeah, there can be lag times, but then what we've also seen is um, like you, in California, at least, uh, where the, um, the largest number of health centers of any state exist, it's easier to get a battery installed than it is a generator because the Air Resource Board is preventing generators uh, and they're, they're, they're incentivizing batteries for energy storage for the whole grid resilience. Also, every commercial, every new commercial building in the state starting this year has to have solar and storage attached to it. No matter what type of building type, if you're a commercial building, it needs solar and storage. So clearly, like we know where the future is going. The future is going clean, renewable energy, not only because it is safe and reliable, but it's just cheaper now than any other form of energy. And so California often is an early leader of some of this stuff, including with electric vehicles, but we're very likely to see other states follow suit to say every new construction has solar and storage. And I think, um, you know, going back to the last question, that, that may be um, lurking in the minds of some folks who are opposed to this. You know, they've, they've heard something about the safety of it or they don't feel that um, based on their experience, you know, it, it varies from community co to community um, in this state as well as others in terms of permitting processes and things like that. Um, it may stem from some of those experiences. Um, and again, just sort of in the grand scheme of things, like Connor said, um, these folks have a lot on their plate. 
Um, you know, we're, of course, just like many other sectors and specifically in healthcare dealing with a lot of staffing problems. So um, where this ranks in terms of a priority, um, I think will grow in the future. But as of now, we have a lot of folks on the watch and wait and hopefully, um, you know, we'll learn and be able to demonstrate to them what is a, a reasonable concern and what other things just you may have heard about but aren't really applicable. Um, in this case, I, I know of one health center that specifically said, well, what happens when salt water comes in contact with the battery, you know, because of their proximity literally to the intercoastal. So there's some very like Florida specific concerns that people have, which I think are valid, you know, based on their experience. So um, we can only answer those questions when they're brought to us. And, and that's what we'll aim to do going forward. Great, and I think our we have time for one last question. And um, let me see here. I, I think I think one that would be nice to end on is um, for folks that have I think probably Connor and Andrew this would apply more to you who have experience having installed solar and storage at health clinics in different parts of the country. So Andrew and I, you spoke a lot to Puerto Rico. Have you seen that? in the years following that they continue to actually work in the event of a power outage like what is your experience with seeing systems and how they perform over time connor do you want to I'm, I'm happy yeah i mean i'm happy to that, that's again like the proof is in the pudding and so i think to sh in a, such clear examples of, of subsequent power outages in Puerto Rico when these sites and these water wells, these fire stations all remained open and operational, it shows, I mean, it shows it works. Um, these systems are not complicated. There's no moving parts, so they will continue to work um, with some simple cleaning and monitoring. Um, so I think more you know, proofs are going to come as projects and systems get built. Um, but what I can tell you is, you know, of, of all the sites in Puerto Rico that haven't yet gotten one installed, it's all it's still their number one priority because they've seen how how effective it is for their colleague organizations. Yeah, and we haven't had any issues with projects not working after commissioning. Everything continues to work exactly as as we expected it to, and continue providing support to the facility. Great, and I'd like to remind everyone on the on the call that if you have interest in learning more about how solar and storage can benefit your critical facility, whether it's a health clinic or something else serving a community, please feel free to reach out to Clean Energy Group and we'd be happy to um, talk to you about that or, or connect you to someone who uh, might know more. But big thank you to all of our panelists. This was an awesome um, conversation, really exciting project. I know I'm excited to see what next steps happen in Florida. So thank you all for being a part of this. Um, Sam, here we go. Just to give everyone a heads up before they pop off, CEG does have some upcoming webinars. Um, U.S. State Renewables Portfolio and Clean Electricity Standards, a review of 2023, Community Solar and Resilience Hub in Minnesota, uh, which is a really interesting case study of work that's going on there, and Can Virtual Plower Plants Replace Peaker Plants, a conversation with CEG and Brattle Group. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say yes on that, but we should listen to them talk more about it. So thanks again for everyone. Please reach out if you have questions and have a great rest of your day.